Thank you so much for having me. Thank you, Adriana, for inviting me. I'm really delighted to be here today. And um, I'm going to just jump right in to my talk. Uh, I had about four cups of coffee <laughs> this morning. So, and I tend to talk kind of fast. So if I start going really fast, just wave your hands at me and uh, I'll try to slow down. But it's, I, I know this is a, a personal problem that I have when I get excited, I tend to talk really quickly. So my talk today is the left side of history, remembering the victims of communism after the crises of capitalism. And um, probably I don't need to do this here, but when I give this talk to other audiences, I have to start with a little bit of a history lesson about Bulgaria. So. I just want to start by uh, pointing out that in January of 1941, Prime Minister Bogdan Filov signed the Law for the Protection of the Nation, which was a package of anti-Semitic laws that severely limited the rights of Bulgaria's Jewish population. In March, on March 1st of 1941, um, King Boris Signed the, sorry, signed the Tripartite Pact with uh, Bogdan Filov as Prime Minister and entered the Second World War on the side of Nazi Germany. So you see here a very nice map. Um, this is really helpful when I give this talk to American audiences who don't know very much about um, World War II in the Balkans. Uh, Hungary, Romania, Bulgaria, obviously were all German allies and participated in the invasion of the Balkans in April of 1941. This is an English translation of warrant number 127 of the Council of Ministers. And what this shows here, and I don't actually have a little pointer, but um, it's important to pay attention to the attending ministers, Bogdan Filov, Peter Gabrovsky, Boris uh, Iostov, and others. Um, this is a warrant that approves the deportation of up to 20,000 Jews inhabiting the recently liberated territories, which are those in uh, Thracian Greece and Macedonia and Bulgarian-occupied Serbia. <clears throat> this is also an English translation of a warrant from Petr Gabrovsky, who at the time was the Minister of Interior Affairs of Bulgaria. It is signed personally by Petr Gabrovsky, and it is um, commissioning the Commissar for Jewish Affairs in Bulgaria to deport the Jews from the recently liberated territories. Now, for a long time, there was some debate as to whether the Germans were responsible for these deportations or whether it was the, Bulga it was the Bulgarians. This debate was recently settled by some documents found in the German archives. Um, the Bulgarians actually submitted a bill to the Germans for the cost of the deportations. And what you can see here is uh, two ordinary uh, trains on their way to Treblinka. Um, the picture below uh, shows that this included 197 children that were deported from these recently liberated territories. We also know from Bogdan Filov's personal diary that after the assassination of Christo Lukov, who was a very nationalist leader uh, in um, Bulgaria, supposedly by a 19-year-old Jewish uh, communist girl, that Filov and Gabrovsky, the Minister of Interior, decided, even though they weren't 100% sure that the communists were to blame for this assassination, that they would use the assassination to step up, and these are his word, repress repressive measures against both the Jews and the communists. Now, it's important to understand um, that in Bulgaria, because Bulgaria was allied with Nazi Germany, the situation for ordinary non-Jewish Bulgarians was actually not that bad. And so the only people who were actually standing up in defense of the Jews in Bulgaria in the early period were in fact the communists. Um, this is a July 1943 article from the newspaper The Workers' Cause. I've uh, translated it here. Um, and this is following the deportation of the Bulgarian Jews from Sofia. So they were deported from Sofia into the provinces. And at that point, it was unclear whether from the provinces they would then subsequently be deported to Treblinka as well. And this newspaper article reads, it is the patriotic duty of every Bulgarian to unite in a powerful campaign in defense of the Jews. 
which will embrace all democratic and patriotic forces in this country and prevent the materialization of the intentions of the king, the government, and the remaining agents of Hitler in this country. We warn you that the problem of the deportation of the Jews from the country is not precluded. The government was obliged to put it off for the time being, but under favorable circumstances, it will try to fulfill its criminal intentions. The latter can be prevented only with a consistent, bold, and persistent struggle. With joint efforts and decisive actions, the fascist beast will be crushed. Now, the book uh, that I've just written is an intimate history of a family of Bulgarian partisans, non-Jewish, and the British SOE officer, Special Operations Executive Officer, Frank Thompson, who was sent in to help them in January of 1944. And what I try to do in this book is to look at the individual actions and motivations of this family of partisans, a sister and three brothers and a father, as well as the British officer who was parachuted in in 1944. Because, as I pointed out earlier, if you were not Jewish, um, the only reason to really fight against the Nazi allied Bulgarian monarchy was mostly because of your convictions as a communist. And in fact, the vast majority of partisans in Bulgaria who fought during the Second World War, War were themselves communists. So, Major Frank Thompson was an Oxford educated um, classicist. He spoke nine languages. He fell in love with Iris Murdoch in the 30s, and she convinced him to join the Communist Party of Great Britain. He signed up to fight in World War II two days before the official British declaration of war. And even though he was a student and was not uh, going to be called up for service until his 20th birthday, he enlisted at the age of 19 because he wanted to fight. His parents, uh, both Oxford, well-known Oxford academics, um, tried to reverse his enlistment, as did Iris Murdoch, but he insisted. And he spent much of the war fighting in North Africa, in the Middle East. He participated in the Sicilian landings in Italy. And after Sicily, he decided that he wanted to go to the Balkans. He spoke um, Bulgarian, he learned Bulgarian, he learned uh, Serbo-Croatian, and uh, he also spoke Greek. But he decided he didn't like Churchill's policies in Greece, so he decided that Bulgaria was where he wanted to go. He went in for parachute training in Cairo, and in January of 1944, he was dropped into Bulgarian-occupied Serbia near Trun. He um, spent all of the winter, the remaining part of the winter and the spring, with the Bulgarian partisans in and out of enemy territory. And uh, in May of 1944, his partisan brigade was ambushed and captured. Frank Thompson was a uniformed British officer, and as such, he should have been held as a prisoner of war under the Geneva Convention. He was held uh, for several weeks, and then for reasons which still remain mysterious, he was taken out and shot, and his body was thrown into a ditch. Um, in contradiction, of course, to the Geneva Convention. The family of partisans that I was interested in starts because of my interest in Elena Lagodinova. She was the youngest female partisan fighting in Bulgaria. She was uh, 11 when she became a yatak, which is a helper to the partisans, and 14 when the gendarmerie burned down her house and she ran into the Piran Mountains and took up arms against uh, the Bulgarian allied government. Um, her two older, uh, she had three brothers, Boris and Konstantin Lagodinov. Konstantin has an amazing story himself. Um, they were also partisans fighting in the mountains. And um, her, the middle brother, Asen Lagodinov, was also a very active um, youth leader, communist youth leader. In 1943, as partisan activity increased, the Bulgarian um, interior minister at that time, uh, a guy called Christo Dochev, who you'll hear about in a little bit, Dochev Christo, sorry, um, put a 50,000 leva bounty for the head of any partisan. And so during this time, bulk, ordinary Bulgarians formed hunting parties and went up into the mountains to find partisans so they could cut off their heads and turn them in for the reward. 
Um, Asen Lagodinov, unfortunately, was one of those who lost his head. Um, and the Bulgarians had the interesting practice <laughs> of mounting these heads on pikes in the center of the village as a deterrent to other Bulgarians who might think of taking up arms against the government. One of the questions that I was interested in when I got involved in this project was how the partisans, these partisans in particular, are remembered in Bulgaria today. And the answer is a rather sad one in the fact that they are pretty much completely forgotten or worse, they're discredited because of their affiliation with communism. And I'll talk about that a little bit later. Frank Thompson is buried in a forgotten grave with two members of the Bulgarian Communist Party and nine unidentified bodies. He, um, his remains were, were interred in Bulgaria and um, for a while during the communist period, he obviously was a, a bit of a local hero. There was a train station named after him. There's a street in Sofia named after him. Um, but for the most part today, he's pretty much completely forgotten. Asen Lagodinov, again, during the communist period, was celebrated. There were many statues to him uh, around, especially Reslog, his hometown. But interestingly, even though he was killed in 1944, fighting against, as I said, the Bulgarian um, monarchy that was allied with Hitler, all of his statues were torn down or defaced after 1989 for the simple reason that he was a communist. And uh, here you have the family basically went around the region and collected as many of these statues as possible. And they're sitting um, in a yard. Uh, this is a picture from last month. Um, this is Elena Lagodinova, who is now 85. Um, the Draga in the middle is the widow of Kostadin Lagodinov, who died at the age of 98 in 2011. And to the left is the 91-year-old Boris Lagodinov. Um, Again, for the most part, they're forgotten uh, or they're um, vilified by uh, Bulgarians because, again, of their affiliation with the Communist Party. And in fact, Elena Lagodinova herself has spent much of the last 25 years in total isolation. So how are the victims of communism remembered. And this is the important uh, shift in my talk. I'm happy to answer more questions about the families um, in the question and answer period. But now I want to shift to the larger issue of historical memory. So I'm going to read you this article that I came across in the Sofia Globe, which is an English language newspaper from 2013. Bulgaria honors memory of victims of communism. Vice President Margarita Popova was among those attending a ceremony on February 1, 2013 in honor of the memory of victims of Bulgaria's communist era, an event held annually on the anniversary of the sentencing to death of 147 people by a kangaroo people's court. This uh, holiday, by the way, was instituted in 2011 for the first time. Those killed on the orders of the People's Court included the three regents during the time of the then boy king, Simeon II, 22 former cabinet ministers, eight royal advisors, 67 members of parliament, and 47 generals and senior officers, including the commanders of all armed forces. At the hands of the Communist People's Court, Bulgaria's former political and military elite was liquidated at a single stroke. Now, the Associated Press picked up this story and sent it out on the newswire. And again, what's remarkable about this is that it gets replicated over and over, particularly in the United States. Bulgaria honors victims of communism. Bulgaria holds vigils in memory of victims of communism. The uh, text is relatively similar. This is Fox News. The Washington Examiner, a, con a conservative uh, newspaper, Bulgaria honors victims of communism. Now, for me, as an American, what I think is particularly interesting about these news stories is nowhere in any of these stories is it mentioned that Bulgaria was allied with Hitler during World War II. Nor is it mentioned that the generals and the leaders of the armed forces were those who were, in fact, in some ways responsible for the deportation of the Bulgarian, of the Jews from, sorry, the, the liberated territories. Bulgaria bows to victims of communism. This um, celebration has been held again in 2014 
It was again held this year in 2015 with a similar type of language. Nowhere is it mentioned who these victims of communism are. This picture that you see is the wall of the monument to the victims of communism in Sofia. This is the wall that was erected in 1999 during the period of a pro-US government. And I'm going to read you the text, which is in Bulgarian here on the left. It's translated here. This was a uh, text that appeared on the virtual Victims of Communism monument, which was uh, set up in 2009. Bow before this wall, fellow Bulgarians. It contains the suffering of our people. This memorial has been erected for our compatriots, victims of the communist terror, those who lost their lives, those who vanished without a trace, those who were shot by the so-called People's Tribunal. It commemorates the concentration camp prisoners, the political prisoners, those who were interned, those subjected to political repression, and their ill-fated families and relatives. May the memory of the innocently shed blood burn in our hearts like an eternal flame. May the past never repeat itself. Lord, give peace to the souls of your martyrs. Grant them your justice. Accept them as our guardians, holy and immortal, now and forever. Amen. This text also appeared on the Victims of Communism website. In 1944, communism was forcefully introduced in Bulgaria. Terror followed overnight and lasted a very long time. Thousands were murdered or sent to prisons and concentration camps for being wealthy, educated, skilled, politically dangerous, or for no pretext whatsoever. In an article in the English language magazine Vagabond called Forgotten Victims, which was promoting the launch of this website, the journalist wrote, the killings of the opponents of the Soviet system started as early as 9th September 1944, the very day that communists seized power in Bulgaria. Nobody knows how many Bulgarians lost their lives in the first week of the people's democracy, their only crime being their political opinion or their social position. Now, of course, there were many true victims of communism in Bulgaria. I am not denying the reality of victimhood. My issue is with the word innocent, nevinovni, as a modifier of all victims of communism. So out of curiosity, because I was doing research on these uh, partisans, I decided to figure out exactly who was listed on the Victims of Communism website. General Kochostayanov was personally in charge of Frank Thompson's torture and interrogation. He actually committed suicide in 1944 before the partisans captured him, but he is nevertheless listed as a victim of communism. Boris Lukanov Stayanov, who is not related to the other guy, um, was actually found wearing Frank Thompson's shoes, and he admitted to shooting Thompson in the back as part of the gendarmerie firing squad in 1944. Today, he is remembered in Bulgaria as a victim of communism. Dojo Christov was the Minister of Interior later in the war. He was the one who introduced the 50,000 leva bounty for partisan heads, which resulted in the decapitation of Asen Lagodinov. But he too is remembered as a victim of communism. And it's particularly important that you see the death date here, because this is a, one day after the sentences were carried. Were, um, it's the day that they chose to commemorate that holiday, February 1st, right? Because that's when the sentences were given, they were carried out the next day. So it's clear that these are people that were in those cabinet ministers, Bulgaria's political and military elite. Bogdan Filov, the prime minister of Bulgaria from 1940 to 43, who signed the tripartite pact on March of 1941, is remembered today as a victim of communism. Peter Gabrovsky, whose signature is on the deportation orders and was responsible for the deportation of over 11,000 Jews from the newly liberated territories, is remembered today as a martyr, as a victim of communism in Bulgaria. 
Another victim of Bulgaria who was not technically a victim in the literal sense was General Nikola Zhekov. And here somebody has actually highlighted his name in white on the wall in Sofia. He was a personal friend of Adolf Hitler and the Minister of War during World War I and the General of the Infantry from 36 to 44. Zhekov actually escaped to Germany after 1944, and he died of natural causes in Bulgaria, uh, sorry, in, in Bavaria in 1949, far from any Bulgarian firing squad, but his name is listed on the victims of communism. Alexander Belev was the commissariat of Jewish affairs, who is also listed as a victim of communism. Christo Lukov, this one's my favorite, because in Bulgaria today, Every year there's a Lukov March, which is a very nationalistic occasion. And every year European NGOs try to protest um, the mayor of Sofia giving the permit for this march. This is a quote from the European Network Against Racism. The Lukov March is the most important public event of right-wing groups in Bulgarian society, which have shown open or covert adherence to fascist, neo-Nazi, and ultra-nationalist populist ideas. The Lukov March is especially dangerous for its impact on young people, promoting authoritarian and anti-democratic ideas in the guise of patriotism and reverence for national war heroes. And yet, Lukov is listed as a victim of communism. He was also, uh, he led the Bulgarian uh, National Legions as well. <coughs> so, in 2013, I actually wrote an article about this, blackwashing history for Anthropology News, basically saying this is crazy, right, that these um, victims of communism memorials are going up without any thought to who is actually being listed as victims of communism, particularly as innocent victims of communism who died for no pretext whatsoever. News of my article actually got round to the foundation that um, hosts this website. And so they very quickly went in and changed it from victims of communism to prosopography of communist repression in Bulgaria. Now what's interesting is that they've kept the exact same URL, victimsofcommunism.bg. Some of the text that I quoted, they removed because they realized that it was a little bit problematic. However, they did not remove any of the names. Bogdan Filov is still listed as a victim of communism. Christo Lukov is still listed as a victim of communism. Any of you who are online could go to this website right now. <coughs> Petr Gabrovsky is still listed as a victim of communism. So the question is, why is this happening now? As I said, this holiday was instituted in 2011. So it's a relatively recent vintage in Bulgaria. And the website was put up in 2009. This was a question that really bothered me because it seemed as if there was something larger politically going on. I think that it has to do with the Prague Declaration, which was voted by conservative um, European East European politicians in 2008. And the demands of the Prague Declaration included the creation of a supranational institute for European memory and conscience, as well as increased support for memorials, museums, and national historical institutes charged with investigating the crimes of communism in 2008. Um, and one of the demands I'm going to read here the millions of victims of communism and their families are entitled to ju enjoy justice, sympathy, and understanding, sorry, understanding and recognition for their sufferings in the same way as the victims of Nazism have been morally and politically recognized. And that there should be an all European understanding that many crimes committed in the name of communism should be assessed as crimes against humanity <coughs> in the same way that Nazi crimes were assessed by the Nuremberg trial. Now, this is a sweeping platform. It asks for the revision of, te of history textbooks. It asks for reparations. It asks for a lot of things. It also um, created the, uh, there's a European Day for the Remembrance of the Victims of Nazism and Stalinism, which has been celebrated since 2008. Um, this 
platform of European memory and conscience was in fact created in 2011 by conservative central European politicians to promote the two totalitarians narrative equating the crimes of communism with those of Nazism. On January 20th of 2012, the 70 Years Declaration was presented to the President of the European Parliament. This was signed by 70 um, members of European Parliament, rejecting all, quote, attempts to obfuscate the Holocaust by diminishing its uniqueness and deeming it to be equal, similar, or equivalent to communism as suggested by the 2008 Prague Declaration. I was also just at a conference um, in Bucharest a few weeks ago sponsored by the United States Memorial Holocaust Museum, and I understood from the director that the Holocaust Museum has also come out against the Prague Declaration. <laughs> Seamus Milne, writing in The Guardian at the time that these debates were taking place, said, the rewriting of history is spreading Europe's poison. And I quote, the pretense that Soviet repression reached anything like the scale or depths of Nazi savagery, or that the post-war enslavement of Eastern Europe can be equated with wartime Nazi genocide is a mendacity that tips towards Holocaust denial. Now, I want to come back to this quote. In 1944, communism was forcefully introduced in Bulgaria. Thousands were murdered or sent to prison and concentration camps for being wealthy, educated, skilled, politically dangerous, or for no pretext whatsoever. Now, I think the use of the term concentration camps is also very interesting here. But I want you to look at the sponsors, the America for Bulgaria Foundation, the American Research Center in Sofia, and a few individuals. So where is the money coming from? It turns out, not surprisingly, that conservative politicians in Germany and the United States are behind these virtual memorials. So you he see here Conrad, uh, the Conrad Adenauer Foundation. And if you look a little bit back behind the American Research Center in Sofia, you will see that their project has been funded by the America for Bulgaria Foundation. The America for Bulgaria Foundation, um, if you look at their history, was actually a project of USAID from the State Department that goes back to the first, uh, first Bush presidency and seed money that was sent into Eastern Europe to essentially make Eastern Europe more pliable for American businesses and to promote democracy. Um, in fact, if you look at the America for Bulgaria Foundation, much of what they've done is to make a lot of money off of selling Bulgarian mortgage products for their homes. Um, and privatizing uh, pension plans. Also involved in this um, American memorialization of the victims of communism is the Victims of Communism Memorial Foundation, which was also launched in 2009. It is one of the two American members of the Platform for European Memory and Conscience. Um, and uh, not surprisingly, perhaps, once again, if you look at who's behind the Victims of Communism Memorial, and there's a Victims of Communism Museum that's online, what you see, in fact, is that they are largely transnational corporations, like Lockheed Martin, an arms manufacturer, Pfizer's um, Pharmaceuticals, Phillips International, you may know, the Washington Times, Many exile organizations in the United States and Vietnamese Americans are also participated. And I think very interestingly, for those of you who know the American political scene, the Heritage Foundation, which is one of the most right-wing think tanks in the United States, are behind these victims of communism memorializations. So what effect is this having on the political discourse in Eastern Europe more broadly? Now, I know the Bulgarian case very well. And so here I'm just going to gesture to some larger implications, I think, of the Prague Declaration and the twin totalitarianism's discourse, which has become completely accepted in Germany, for instance, where I'm currently based. So three weeks ago in Bucharest, I heard an amazing paper about the acquittals of Radu Dinolescu and Gheorghe Petrescu, who were two Romanian war criminals involved in the deportation of Romania's Jews to Transnistria who were rehabilitated, actually acquitted by the Romanian Supreme Court. 
Um, the cases were initiated by, not surprisingly, uh, their grandchildren who wanted to get some of the property back that was nationalized. Um, and the young lawyer who gave this paper suggested that there might have been some palm greasing going on behind the scenes. But because this was a decision of the, book of the Romanian Supreme Court, it cannot be reversed. And so these two um, men are now fully acquitted of their crimes. Um, and the technical aspects of the case are very interesting because if you're interested in the legal question, it had to do with the legitimacy of the court that convicted them, which is also what happened in Bulgaria in 1996 when some of, um, in fact, the death sentences of Bogdan Filov and Peter Kobrovsky were also overturned on legal technicalities. In Hungary, yet another uh, Nazi ally during World War II, Last summer, they built this amazing monument at the end, one end of Freedom Square. I don't know if anybody has seen this. This is the symbol of Hungary. This is the Archangel Gabriel holding this orb, right? And it's being swooped down upon by this iron eagle. And uh, if you look at the cuff of the eagle on its, um, uh, what do you call it, talon, it says 1944. And this is symbolic of Hung Hungary's victimhood in the face of Nazi aggression. Uh, there's an amazing counter protest that has uh, spontaneously arisen. Um, many, many Hungarians are very angry about what they see as state level Holocaust denial on the part of the Orban government. Um, and this is a, a very heated uh, debate right now within Hungary. Right across the, the park, from this new monument is the old uh, Soviet war memorial. And when I happened to be there uh, for a talk in the fall, there was a, a small, this was a small gathering of people. They were getting ready to have a protest to demolish the Soviet war memorial, um, which I don't think they can because it's actually um, a grave, right? Um, but interestingly, just last month, Balint Homan was rehabilitated. Um, this was a uh, Hungarian academician who had very extreme anti-Semitic views. And again, this was a decision of the court based on legal technicalities. A day after the court had rehabilitated Homan, uh, one of the uh, politicians wrote that his proponents on the government side wanted to restore Holman's honor by this decision, but that can be done only with, quote, the restoration of the honor of Nazi Germany, Hitler, the leaders of the Arrow Cross, and mass murderers. Right now, there certainly seems to be an attempt to forget about Holman's real sins. This is just last month. The other thing that happened last month, which has also created a huge outcry in academic circles, are these new decommunization laws that were debated in April and then finally passed into law in Ukraine just last month. And uh, these laws make it imprisonable offense up to five years for singing the Internationale. Any, any uh, communist symbolism um, is an uh, offense, and it actually creates a history of Ukraine that it is illegal to contradict. This was an article that appeared in The Nation, which I think is very interesting. The law, still to be signed by the president, which it just was, is more about silencing the left than anything else, and I'm going to come back to this in a second. But uh, clearly, this law is meant um, as a way of Poroshenko to create an official Ukrainian history that cannot be contradicted by free speech, for instance, by any scholarship. And there was a very passionate letter that was penned by a consortium of historians and academics worldwide um, protesting the passage of these laws, which have now gone into effect. Just last month as well, as you may know, the Croatian leader paid tribute to pro-Nazi collaborators who were killed in Bleiburg um, in a move that was also roundly condemned by many people. And as I was preparing this talk, Adriana uh, sent me the information about uh, Draza Mikhailovic, who was also recently, just last month, I believe, rehabilitated. 
um, on similar grounds that there were legal technicalities in the trial. So why is this all happening? And it's happening so quickly. And it's happening at a moment when the Eurozone is teetering on the brink of collapse after the 2008 financial crisis and the various shocks that have um, impacted these countries. So locally, I would argue, and this is certainly true in the case of Romania, Hungary, and Bulgaria, by equating the crimes of communism with the Holocaust, East European countries have a much, uh, achieve a much coveted victimhood status, which at least partially absolves them from their complicity in their own country's crimes against the Jews. And this is very clearly happening in Ukraine, too. So that one of the things that these new decommunization laws do is to make anybody who fought against the Soviets a national hero in Ukraine. And that means, in the Ukrainian case, many people who fought together with the Nazis and were complicit in the Holocaust. However, I would like to argue that there are larger purposes of these memory projects. The first of these is to equate all discussions of social justice and redistribution with the terrors of Stalinism. I think a lot of people have looked at these, um, the Prague Declaration and the subsequent memory projects. And what they do very clearly is to make a complete equivalence between anything on the left and Nazism. And it also is to convince people that there is no alternative to neoliberal capitalism. So, I think that economic elites are terrified, right, um, by the idea of increased wealth distribution and the challenging of corporate power and neoliberal capitalism in its current form. They stand much to lose from a change in the status quo, and so they are complicit with the intentional distortion of this history. And here I, so, I cite Jody Dean, who was here very recently, but I also love this. This is actually a comic, but it just speaks volumes. And it says, when you program open source, you're programming communism. And at the bottom it says, a reminder from your friends at Microsoft, right? So that anything that you do, right, um, it, it, it becomes communism. Here's a couple of other examples. This was a cartoon about Occupy World, Wall Street in the United States in 2011. And you see the young guy says, we're citizens to confront corporate power. And the young woman says, that's awesome. We should put that on a flag. And this is the flag, right? So that confronting corporate power in the United States is the equivalent in American imagination of the Soviet Union. The Pope. Is he a liberal or a Stalinist of God? <coughs> this was in foreign policy, OK? Um, and I have a bunch of examples of, of language calling the Pope a Marxist or communist. This is uh, Tsipras. And, uh, and these memes are everywhere in Germany right now. So that any attempt right, to challenge the hegemony of the Troika immediately degenerates into picturing, imagining the Greek prime minister as a reincarnation of Stalin. So, to conclude, I think that some of the ideals that communism stood for are good ideals that many still cherish. For instance, the end of exploitation, racial and ethnic equality, the emancipation of women, national self-determination, etc. Believing that workers should be paid more or that immigrants should be treated fairly does not mean condoning the secret police or the gulag. And I think that this is really an important distinction to make. And I can't tell you, I mean, especially as an American right now, looking at what's happening with the black population in my country and the injustice that is being perpetuated, not to mention austerity and all the human costs of that, to, to have a situation in which anybody who protests racism or xenophobia or the exploitation of women or corporate power is immediately called a Stalinist is incorrigible. These are some wonderful examples. This is uh, Die Linke, which is the left party in Germany. This was a, 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 a meme that was sent around our candidate, Joseph Stalin. And again, down below, you see Obama, yes we can, <coughs> Joseph Stalin. 
Reducing all leftist ideals to Stalinism and calling anyone who questions the long-term sustainability or desirability of global capitalism a communist, I believe is an intentional rhetorical strategy of the political and economic elite who have the most to lose from any challenge to the current status quo. We need, we need a more nuanced and careful discussion of the communist past, one that does, does not deny or ignore the many crimes perpetrated by 20th century totalitarian regimes, but one that resists the impulse to reduce its entire history to those crimes. So I have three points. One. Honoring the true victims of totalitarianism is a noble and honorable project that deserves to be supported. However, including the names of known fascists among the names of the innocent debases this project. And therefore, I believe that memory projects like these are more about perpetuating anti-communist sentiment, and here I mean anti-left broadly, than about truly honoring those people who were victims. Thank you for your attention.